Um, the email <coughs> Sorry? Of the email indicator? Um, no, no, it's back in the stack stuff. The, okay. Uh, um, <coughs> the, the epilogue after a... Oh, um, yeah, you're still, okay, so you're still looking at the frame point over. I, I understand that, um, you know, there are common ways they um, take the EVP and set it to the ESP. You move it to the ESP. Yep. And then you pop the ESP off the stack, or the EVP EVP. off the stack. But do, do, does it do anything with it after that? <coughs> Isn't it the return value, the thing, one more up the stack that it uses to go to the next instruction at the end? Yes, that's right. So does it do any, so if the idea is you can manipulate that EVP, yep. but if all, when, at the end of the function, when he pops the EVP off the stack, is there anything that's done with that EVP? Is it? Not at that point, but think about what happens when the next function returns. That you mean the next, well, if you're in the subroutine, you're going back to whatever called that subroutine. Yep. And that's the reference in the, uh, what is that data call, the one right before the EVP? <coughs> yeah, yeah, so we'll say that the main function called, you know, frame pointer functions, the vulnerable function. So at the point where you exit the vulnerable function, you will have overwritten, you will be controlling EVP, right? Once you're back into the main function, you're controlling EVP. Okay, so EVP is still, but it's popped off the stack. Yes, so. it is. And you're corrupting the least significant byte of that in the vulnerable function. But when it's popped off the stack, is anything done with that? Is it used as an instruction for the next, for something? <coughs> Not at that point, but if, if you look at the, um, the main function, so at that point, it's popping EVP off the stack, okay? And so, um, and you manipulated that EVP value, so you now control the EVP, right? So at this point, for your execution, you have uh, influenced the value EVP. Oh, right? so you can, so that EVP will still be there when you call the next subroutine? Is that? Um, yes, it will. Oh, okay. Yeah. So well, you could create your own next subroutine using that EVP, and then not not like that. So just think that you can call the EVP register at that point, okay? EVP for e register belongs to you. Okay. If you look at the epilogue for the main function, what you'll see is a move ESP EVP. So so ESP called EVP. Since you control EVP at that point. You also control ESP. Okay. Got it. Uh, so if you, if you control ESP, <coughs> you control what gets popped off the stack because you control where the stack points. To. All right. And the return instruction is basically a pop EIP. So since you control the stack, you control what gets popped off the stack, you also control EIP. So when something gets popped off the stack, it goes straight into EIP. Yes. Um, that's that's when uh, when a return function happens, it's like a pop in the EIP. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, how are my uh, remote people doing? Debbie and Carrie and Butch? Fine, thank you. Do you, uh, do you guys have any specific questions or material you would like to uh, for me to go over again before we start with the new material today? So I I, I don't know if I don't know if we're going to go <laughs> over you know how, where we're going to start, but um, I don't really understand the why the allocator stuff has had it, is any has any significance to the heap stuff yet, and you're probably going to explain that, but so. The allocator controls um, the sizing of the heap. So the allocator, the memory that the allocator is giving you is coming from the heap, okay? And um, what we'll see eventually is that by having an overflow in the heap, we can corrupt some of the allocator's meta information it stores on the heap. And by corrupting that information, we can cause our shell code to execute. And we'll be doing that for the first few hours of today. OK, 
Okay, so um, you guys ready to get started? So when I um, when we were leaving yesterday, I told you sort of what our, one of our next things would be, um, and I'm doing this a little bit out of order of my slides, and it would be uh, trying to cause the heap allocator to crash, or a scrappy allocator to crash. So I think I talk about this a little bit on. Um, <clears throat> Starting in slide number 89, and slide number 89 to 91 describes basically the next lab that we're going to be working on, what I sort of slightly introduced to you. It's basically just causing the, um, trying to cause the allocator to crash, okay? Because an important thing that you need to be aware of in this class is this right here. This is something I want you to all take away from the class. If you can, if the vulnerability is present in an application, if you can gain control of EIP, then you can crash the application. Okay. So every time you see Internet Explorer or Adobe Reader crash when you open it, um, that means that there could be an underlying underlying vulnerability there. And it makes sense, right? Because if you can gain, gain control of EIP and point it at your shell code, then obviously you can point at some bogus value and cause the application to crash. So when you hear about fuzzing and uh, things like that, basically what fuzzing is is just trying to generate as many crashes in an application as possible. And then hopefully one of those crashes will um, represent an underlying vulnerability. So. If there is a vulnerability present, you can't crash the application. But just because you, know, you can crash an application doesn't mean that a vulnerability is present. The inverse is not true. If you have something like a null pointer D reference or divide by zero, uh, that is likely not exploitable. But obviously, the application also will crash on those errors. But if you have a buffer overflow, um, obviously, you can get a crash. And usually, you can uh, get control of EIP as well. So with that in mind, we're going to try to um, crash the memory allocator via buffer overflow. And what we'll find is that we have to position the heap in some way through a series of allocations and deallocations. And then once the heap is uh, organized how we want it, a buffer overflow will corrupt the heap meta information that is uh, stored on the heap. And then eventually we'll get a crash. So we just want to find that crash right now. And then hopefully that will end up being um, representative of some underlying vulnerability. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the heap layout and um, what we want to see happen in this lab. So Bill, I'm going to draw some on the board here. We have this file in the uh, alloc directory, which is the lab we're working on right now, called uh, allocuser.c. And the main things we're going to put in allocuser.c are allocations, deallocations and a buffer overflow somewhere. So we have a uh, alloc some number the dealloc junk just to the clear memory chunk equals allocate some number, you know how many bytes we need deallocate that chunk, mark it as free, and then we'll also have like a buffer overflow in there. Because uh, we'll want the buffer overflow to corrupt some heap meta information and ultimately, ultimately result in a crash, so that's going to be in there somewhere. So it'll be like, uh, actually, that more clear, chunk, and we'll say like arg v one. Can you guys read that okay? Sorry. And you know, our view was that first main line argument like in the, uh, the basic rule up again. So we're going to have things like this in the alloc user.c. And um, just to help you visualize what happens is, so this is our heap right here. At the beginning of the execution of alloc user, it's just nothing, right? Nothing's on our heap yet because we haven't allocated anything. Then an alloc comes along. And the, uh, the user requests 32 bytes or something like that. And a chunk is created on the heap. So 
So there's my um, crawl over my other stuff. There's my first chunk. <coughs> and Keith, can you see this? Okay, if I have my other line way down here. Okay, so and this is my uh, chunk meta information, right? Remember, I talked about at the beginning of each chunk is um, like available <coughs> size and then pointers, which basically compose our linked list. These are stored at the beginning of every chunk. So we do an alloc, and this is what we get, all right? We do another alloc. We get another chunk and more meta information. So we'll say this is chunk one. Chunk two. Okay, so here's a question for you guys. Let's assume alloc user did something like this. So we have, I'll just say uh, C1 for chunk one equals alloc C2 equals alloc. All right, so this is what my heap is looking like based on the source code here. This is what would be happening to the heap. C3 equals alloc. Now, if I do a buffer overflow in a second chunk, so we'll say string copy C2, then, you know, data. If I overflow C2, where will my overflow go? Meta chunk three. Yes. So what is different about this? So if I had an overflow in chunk two, like Rob just pointed out, it would go blah, 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 overflow, and it would destroy uh, chunk three's meta information, okay? All this would be over in like 41, 41, 41, 41, and it would probably even go up into here somewhere. So what's weird about this is that an overflow here Basically, overflowed, blah, 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 and blah, for this thing. If this was a stack, it would have been the other way around. Okay? If these were stack variables, if I overflowed C2, imagine these are just character or local character buffers, C2 would have overflowed C1, and that's because the stack grows down and the heap grows up. Right? So just keep in mind when you're working on this lab, an overflow in C2 is going to overflow this guy, and this is what the heap looks like. So I just want you guys to visualize that. However, if you put uh, alloc, you know, if you put this in alloc user dot c and did an overflow, you probably wouldn't get a crash, um, just because we haven't sufficiently corrupted the heap yet. So I, what I want you guys to do is play around with the alloc user dot c file and um, do something like this with a series of allocations and then a buffer overflow, and then I'll go ahead and give you a hint. You're going to have another heap operation here. And I won't tell you which chunk it will be on. Obviously you want to do a heap operation affecting um, one of the chunks that has corrupted meta information. And you want that after the buffer overflow, the next heap operation to do, which is either an allocate or a deallocate, right? It's only two operations to do. Either allocate or deallocate on some chunk here will cause a crash. And I want you guys to play around with, you know, a series of allocations and deallocations to order the, the heap in some way so that you think after you do a buffer overflow and corrupt some heap meta information, you'll be able to cause a crash by doing a, a the next allocator deallocate will cause a crash. Yeah. Are we supposed to use the standard malloc? Are we supposed to use for? No, just use my malloc. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, one thing to keep in mind as well is that let's just um, draw the heap again, just to help you guys visualize what's going on and what is possible with the heap. Let's say my alloc user Let's say my alloc user does C1 equals alloc 10, 1 and 10 bytes, okay? <coughs> Same as here, chunk 1 is created, my heap looks like this, get rid of this. So an alloc user I do, C1 equals alloc. 10 bytes. This is what my heap looks like. We all follow that, right? Makes sense? Then I do dalloc <coughs> c1. My heap at this point still looks like this, except a bit is set in here to say this is now available. Available equals 1. And it's on the link list now, too. Okay? So this is what my heap looks like. Now, if I do C2 equals alloc 10, what does my heap look like now? Anyone know? Yeah. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same, because it would just reuse chunk 1. Okay? It would set available equals 0, but the, the heap would still be the same. So if, I had, if there's an over, overflow below this, it might have corrupt this information and cause problems, but for now, everything is okay with the heap, so um, I do this allocation, the heap stays the same because it reuses its chunk. But let's say we do C2 alloc 20, then what would the heap look up? Then, it would, yeah, that would just go up, right? I'd have to create another chunk. So, now that you can visualize what is happening with the heap, I want you to do you know, this series of allocations and deallocations and a um, buffer overflow. And then with the next heap operation you do, allocate or deallocate, I'll tell you which one, you should get a crash. And I want you to play around with trying to discover how to make that happen. It's all about structuring the heap in the right way so that when you perform the buffer overflow, you corrupt what you need to corrupt and cause the crash. You see this a lot with heap vulnerabilities. The attacker has to do a lot of stuff to um, organize the heap in just a special way so that the vulnerability can be exploited. Yeah? The question about the point is, does that point get any location in there, or is it just areas that are confined to where they Yeah, it, it, only, it points to the next in the previous um, free chunk. Um, but if you do an overflow, like if you overflow chunk one and chunk two here, you can corrupt those pointers to point out whatever you want to point out. And that's important. Yeah. Um, with the deallocator, calls your defrag heap thing. Does yeah. that significantly change the link list? It worked to where, I, you know, chunk two is not necessarily contiguous with chunk one. They are still contiguous. Okay. It does change. It does change the heap, but. Um, it like rewrites all the heap meta information, but everything is still contiguous. It doesn't change the order of anything. So I want you guys to play around with that for a little bit. Just try to get the uh, good old second hey, to happen. Um, maybe yeah. my C is a little rusty, but I'm looking over the alloc user.c file. And yeah. I'm trying to understand exactly uh, the, where the input's being used that the user provides. Okay, um, let me show you on the screen here. So if you see this str copy right here, yeah, the uh, argv1, this is actually like the first command line argument passed to the program. So um, if I ran the program like alloc user a, b, c, d, e, f, 
A, B, C, D, E, F is um, what is RD1 at that particular point in time. So it's basically just like the argument you're passing to the program. And is that coming in through the, uh, through the char um, argv? Yes. Exactly. But we're not, using, <coughs> we're not passing in an in argc, is that correct? Uh, that is implicitly passed in by the operating system. That argc equals how many okay. command line arguments were uh, sent to the program. Like in this case, it would be um, two, and that's because it implicitly counts the, uh, the program name as the first argument. Okay, so one, two. And if I added another argument like second arg, it would be um, arg c would be equal to three, and so, and so on. So the all you have to know though is that that arg v one is equal to whatever you pass as the argument for outlock user. So if I was instead to make this like a Perl e print. A times 1,024. Yeah. It would, you know, replace that with 1,024 A's and, um, you know, overflow that sub one buffer. So the what makes this code quote unquote crappy is the fact that you've made that hard allocation to buff one without any checking. Um, what makes so you, you've, you've limited it to 128, but you've done no checking to make sure that what I pass you doesn't exceed 128. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Corey, we have to use uh, GCC for the uh, Use GCC, yeah. You could technically use GCC, but just use GCC because you'll need it later for turning this into a real uh, exploit. <coughs> oh, to compile it? Yeah. Okay, so um, to compile a program, do so build script. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you just do that, yeah. So you can modify alloc user.c, don't modify alloc.c. In the real world, that would be like a DLL or a shared library, but um, it's kind of a pain to compile things into a shared library on so site. Oh, also, if your screen gets messed up with the colors and all that, you can just type reset and hit enter. And it'll fix the colors. So, for instance, I'm going to make an attempt here at making things crash. You know, I did this first one with just a creating the buffer and doing, doing a string copy and a deallocation, and it didn't work. There was no crash. You know, I, I built this, and if I try to crash it, So, okay, that didn't work. Maybe if I add in another chunk, so like char chunk <coughs> 2 equals alloc 128. And then, um, <coughs> so now I should be corrupting up chunk 2's meta information, right? Because I'm overflowing buff 1, it's going into buff 2, maybe that'll cause my crash. Still not. Mm. <coughs> I want you guys to uh, miss that a little bit. <coughs> Before I gave you too many For a dialog, <coughs> uh, so that does not modify structure of the chunks. It, it just modifies whether they're the flag or whether they're free or not? Um, 
It does not modify the order of the chunks, no, but it does modify some of the chunk by net information. If only the, the free plan? Um, no, it actually, because remember I said the deallocate is kind of dumb and just rebuilds the whole heap. So it will actually um, reset all the chunk net information. <coughs> That's the right question to ask. You're thinking along the right path. But the, uh, the meta information is this, the availability and the size. Right? And two pointers. Ah. But, okay. but, you, but you said the pointers are, all, are always going to be the same. It's going to point to the next one and the previous one. Yeah. And those are always, um, it's what I meant is, do you ever like short, the, during the deallocate, does it ever short circuit a pointer to, you know, instead of pointing to that next one, it points to a different one for some optimization reason. Yep. But the only metadata that you would, that the allocate should, according to what you said, would be um, the availability because it's still going to point to the next one and the previous one, and the size is going to be the same, right? The way yeah, that's technically what it should do, but uh, it does change other stuff. Just because that was uh, easier from an implementation standpoint. So just keep in mind that whenever you do a deallocate, it is going to, uh, let's say you do a buffer overflow here. So I overflowed chunk one, this is chunk two, and I blew away the net information. If I also do a deallocate, it would actually repair all this meta information. All this would be repaired thanks to the So obviously, deallocate is probably not the uh, heap operation that's going to cause the crash. It repairs everything, right? Which would leave only one other contender in the arena for what's going to cause the crash. And so something to, um, to think about is that, I, you know, you know at this point that the crash will happen during an allocation. All right, and um, in the chunk meta information are two pointers that you can potentially corrupt during a buffer overflow, the previous and next pointers. So you can corrupt those. Like uh, in the in the picture I drew here, this is chunk two. Overflow in chunk one corrupts chunk two and its meta information, including its next and previous pointers. <coughs> So I can say I have an overflow here. Next equals 401, 411. Previous equals 41, 41. I'll do a deallocate. Those would be repaired. What I want, I want to force the allocator to use those corrupted pointers somehow. All right. So think about how to do that. How can I force the allocator to chew on these pointers that I've corrupted? And to know how to do that, you have to understand how the heap allocator is working. So play around with this. Again, go back to the previous screen. What was that? Can you go back to the previous screen? Yeah. yeah. All right, so Dave, why don't you tell us, um, as a hint to the other students, did you overflow? <laughs> What type of chunk was it that you overflowed that inevitably led to the crash? Was it a free chunk, an allocated chunk? Yeah, an available chunk. Free? Yeah, so it was a free chunk, all right? And the reason he used a free chunk is because he wanted those corrupted pointers, the next and previous pointers, to be used. And those are only used when the, uh, the chunk is uh, on the free list.
can either Josh or Dave tell me um, what is the exact function in the memory allocator that the crash is occurring in? No. Is it unlinked chunk? Yeah. And so what is that function responsible for? It is responsible for removing the chunk from the, uh, the free list, from the linked list of free chunks. So it's in the process of redirecting the, the yes. pointers yep. in the adjacent yeah. nodes in the list. <clears throat> so Bill, I'm going to draw something else on the board. What the, uh, the unlinked chunk function does, Whenever you have a chunk on a free list that the allocator is going to reuse, it needs to remove it from that linked list of, um, of chunks. So let's imagine our linked list is like uh, like this. These are my chunks. And then this is the free list of chunks. Then I have these forwards and backwards pointers in each of them, right? So let's assume that um, this is what the heap looks like. All right. Now forget about this. Let's just assume that we're talking about the free list. And um, I have an overflow that ends up corrupting this free chunk right here. So this chunk was free, and overflow comes over in A, A, A. A totally destroys um, the next and the previous pointer, which is set to like 414141 now. When uh, we do an unlinked chunk operation to remove this from the linked <coughs> list, what we do, and this is common like linked list deletion functionality, is we make this point to this. And this point to that. So we basically just like our, uh, you know, making the pointers jump around that way. <coughs> the way that you actually do this in C is you do something like we're talking, we're unlinking this from the uh, the link list. We would say like this next pointer pointer previous pointer. So this guy's previous pointer, let me draw my original diagram here. Pointer, so this chunk's previous pointer equals previous pointer. And if you look at the unlinked chunk function, you'll see it's doing something similar to that in the <laughs> file. So this line right here would say next pointer, previous pointer. So this guy right here equals previous pointer. So basically points over here. And then it would say previous pointer <coughs> pointer equals next pointer. And that would basically said this guy's next pointer all the way to that. And that sort of removes this from the uh, from the link list, from that free list. And so when you corrupt this chunk, both of these are set equal to four to A A A A four one.
So 41, 41, 41 equals previous pointer, and then 41, 41, 41, 41 equals next pointer. And it says 41, 41, 41 is a bogus address. That's why you're getting that crash. Okay. Uh, did what I just described make sense? Okay. So the linked list only points to three chunks of memory. That way when an allocation occurs, it can traverse that linked list and see where, where my free memory blocks are and see if any of them are big enough to satisfy the user's uh, allocation request. So I'll start working out on um, my screen, like what you should do to uh, get the crash. Okay, so with the source code I have up here now, I create two chunks of memory on the heap. Chunk one and chunk two, right? Two chunks of memory on the heap. I mark chunk two is free. Okay? So I still have two chunks of memory on the heap, but one, I have now one on the free list, and it's available bit is set to one. I overflow chunk one, which overflows into chunk two, all right? This corrupts all of chunk 2's meta information, like its pointers and so on. And now, if I do, I'll throw a curveball, you guys. Would this cause a crash? No. Why not? Because. Buff two is open, but it's not going to be used. Right, because it's not <coughs> too small. Yeah. Too small. It won't. Yeah, it would traverse. It would try to traverse this linked list at least, and it would say that, look, the size isn't big enough, so I'm not even going to like consider this. Doesn't that the one written on? Could you um, your size? Jesus. Yeah. So in this case, it would not cause a crash though, because it would successfully get to. Um, to this chunk just by way of the, uh, the uncorrupted beginning head of the list. So like the initial pointer. But I guess if you overwrite it with um, 414141, it, um, it might still cause a crash. So yeah, actually I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, it depends on what you cast in as that. Yeah. It depends actually. Just to be more clear, let's put it up 128. So this would definitely cause a crash because um, you have corrupted all this chunk's meta information, and the allocate algorithm is going to try to um, parse that corrupted meta information when it's traversing the free list. And it's got to see when it tries to use those next and previous pointers, it's going to um, crash on that basically the unlinking chunk function, like I showed you on the board. Now, does everyone follow? Um, why do you need to de uh, do you need to deallocate uh, buff kind of two? You guys? still not. Yes, yes. If you did not deallocate buff two, this would not crash because the allocate algorithm would not even consider would not even look at the uh, the corrupted chunk because it would not be on the free list. The allocate algorithm. So I'm wondering the way it is there now, though, when ways. you added the new alloc for buffer three, if we could get rid of the dealloc buffer two, and it would still look and see that it was corrupted. It would not. Okay. So let's assume that I did not deallocate this. Okay. So what we would have at this point is I'll draw on the board actually. Okay, so at this point, let me get rid of this corruption here. This is good 
metadata <coughs> meta. Okay, so two. So we have allocated buff one and buff two, right? So the heap looks like this. We have two chunks of um, memory, chunk one and chunk two. And we do an overflow in um, the first chunk with that string copy to buff one. And what that does is it goes A, 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 you know, blows all this away. Chunk two's meta information is bad. We'll say this is A's now. But then we come along and we say char buff 3 e equals alloc 128. We invoke the allocate algorithm and it says, OK, the user just requested 128 bytes. Let's see if I have any free chunks that I can uh, serve back to the process. And it says, um, no, actually, I don't because nothing is on the, uh, the free list of free chunks because nothing has been deallocated. So my heap is totally uh, utilized. So I just have to do this. Okay, instead. so it doesn't read the metadata. Doesn't read the metadata uh, when it when it assigns a new when alloc runs. It doesn't read the metadata again. It just looks on the on the uh, link list of what's free. It will only look at the metadata for the for what is on the link list. And in, in this okay. scenario, what you were describing, without that deallocate, nothing is on okay. the free linked list. So that corrupted that information will never be used. I had the same question. And yeah. what I had previously yeah, thought too. was that the linked list was the actual yeah. metadata structures linked together. But right. the linked list is a separate data structure. Yeah. Elsewhere. So yeah, a little bit confusing. You just have to remember that only the um, the free chunks are on the linked list. Because there's no use looking at the already allocated chunks when the, alloc when the allocation algorithm happens, because you can't reissue an already allocated chunk to the process. So to make it faster, you only want the, um, the free chunks to be on that linked list. That way, you're only looking at um, free chunks whenever an allocation happens. That way, Exactly yeah. So quickly. when you when you when you invoke uh, dialog, then, then, then it has to read the theater. metadata, I guess. Just I guess to zero it out, if nothing else. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what we're going to do now. Is uh, we got a crash, and I have told you guys if you can crash it, you can maybe hack it. So that's kind of the first step in the exploitation process. But like I've also hinted at, we'll get into a scenario with this uh, heap overflow where we can arbitrarily change four bytes of memory. And if you can arbitrarily arbitrarily change four bytes of memory, you can obviously change the return address. But there's also lots of other more reliable things you can change to gain control of the instruction pointer. And we're going to do a little mini lab where I give you a program which will change any four bytes of its own process that you tell it to. And um, we will try to leverage that to get our shell code to run. Before we do that, why don't we take like a 10-minute uh, break just so you guys are fresh for that.